The Tao Te Ching begins. The way that can be told is not the constant way. The name that can be named is not the constant name. This way, or Tao in Chinese, is the great text's most important concept, and deserves books worth of analysis. Yet, as said by the first chapter of the text, doing so is impossible. The constant Tao cannot be told, and in another chapter, the Tao Te Ching asserts, the Tao is always nameless. Nameless, it escapes the traps our words set for it. Formless, it slips through the nets we swing at it. Yet, its importance is immense. For the great Tao flows everywhere, both to the left and to the right. The ten thousand things depend upon it. It holds nothing back. It fulfills its purpose silently and makes no claim. It nourishes the ten thousand things, and yet is not their lord. It has no aim. It is very small. The ten thousand things return to it, yet it is not their lord. It is very great. It does not show greatness, and is therefore truly great. Despite not being communicable, its importance is unquestionable. Thus, the Tao Te Ching orients one towards the great without saying Tao itself. Much like a quote from the Vietnamese Tian Buddhist Thich Nhat Hanh, A finger pointing at the moon is not the moon. The finger is needed to know where to look for the moon, but if you mistake the finger for the moon itself, you will never know the real moon. Like a finger pointing at a finger pointing at the moon, with the help of Will, a grad student studying Korean and Taoist philosophy, this video seeks to articulate the Tao Te Ching's articulation of the inarticulatable Tao. Before even getting to the Tao Te Ching, its background deserves an address. On one interpretation, there exists an implicit context surrounding the first lines of the Tao Te Ching. This context is found in the background of the Tao Te Ching, namely, the philosophy of the hundred schools of thought around the time of the Warring States period. Scholars no longer hold the Tao Te Ching to be dated back to the 6th or 5th century BCE, written by one sage by the name of Lao Tzu. Instead, they describe it to be an anthological work, composed by various individuals around the 4th and 3rd century BCE. Given this fact, it is acceptable, and even necessary on many interpretations, to read the Tao Te Ching as written with a numerous other classical Chinese philosophies in mind. Prior schools of thought, including Confucianism, Moism, and more, had already commonly used the same term, the Tao or Wei, but it didn't have the same implications as the Tao familiar to the readers of the Tao Te Ching. Tao, in their sense, implied doctrine, their specific linguistic account of how to live and organize society to bring peace to the warring states. These various schools demarcated and promoted their Tao over those of others. Central to many of the Tao's of the Warring States philosophers was one concept, the rectification of names. While the date is uncertain, the importance of the rectification of names is clear in the Analects. Su Lu said, If the Lord of Wei left the administration of his state to you, what would you put first? The Master, Confucius, said, If something has to be put first, it is perhaps the rectification of names. This sentiment is shared by the likes of the Moists and Legalists in the Warring States too. Names must be set out and they must be correct. Again from the Analects, Duke Ching of Qi asked Confucius about government. Confucius answered, Let the ruler be a ruler, the subject a subject, the father a father, the son a son. Thus, the operation of the rectification of names occurs at two levels, that of ethical or social behavior and that of the physical universe. Correct names are necessary in the former case, so that affairs, the conduct of social and political life, should not be hampered, and in the latter, so that ideas should not be misunderstood and proper communication be possible. When names are not rectified, social chaos will be rampant and knowledge of reality will be impossible. This is the context in which the first two lines of the Tao Te Ching appear. The Tao Te Ching thus begins with a twofold rejection of both the Tao's of prior schools and of their doctrine, the rectification of names. As I said in the introduction, the first line begins, the way that can be told is not the constant way. The ways that have been told, those of the Confucians, Moists, Legalists, and more, are not the constant way. Being doctrinal, they fail to reach the true way, because the constant way cannot be told. For this reason, Shipper wrote, 
All the schools, Confucian, Moist, Legalist, etc., spoke of their Tao, their own way and specific doctrine which was at the center of their system, whereas the school of thought to which the name Taoist was later given maintained, on the contrary, that the true Tao, the permanent one, which eternally endures and survives, is not a Tao, that is, not a doctrine or a system. The second line may be seen as an outright rejection of the rectification of names. The rectification of names sought for names and realities to match. Yet the Tao Te Ching holds that the true constant name cannot be named. With this, then, the names that are so rectified are proved limited and short. Nothing can be said definitively. This is further rejection of the rectification of names, already undermined by the insufficiency of doctrinal philosophy through the eyes of the Tao Te Ching. There is also an implicit connection between the constant Tao and the constant name. Incapable of being told, the constant Tao is inseparable from the constant name, which is incapable of being named. Thus, we find the Tao, from the outset of the text, to be inexpressible through words or name. Just two lines in, one reaches the nameless Tao of the Tao Te Ching. The constant Tao, or the Tao Te Ching's Tao, is nameless. We need not rely on inferring this from the first two lines, when it is explicitly stated in the 32nd chapter. The Tao is always nameless. But a question follows. Why must the Tao be nameless? The answer lies in the essence of names and uses of language. Names serve to delineate and differentiate. If I ask for a chair and am brought a book, I could say, I ask for a chair and you've brought me a book. This book is not a chair. Don't you know what a chair is? When names are unknown or mistaken, they fail to specify particulars. Hence, the need for the rectification of names, if one is to properly communicate with others. Furthermore, as a tool of differentiation, names are also limiting. I know a chair in contrast to that which is not a chair. A chair is a chair insofar as it is not a book, nor a desk, nor a lamp, and so on. By defining what a chair is, by assigning it a name, I am limiting what a chair is by distinguishing it from all the things that are not chairs. Thus, names serve to differentiate and limit. With this in mind, we can return to the Tao. Is the constant Tao something that can be limited? Looking at chapter 73, the answer is no. The way of heaven excels in overcoming, though it does not contend, in responding, though it doesn't speak, in attracting, though it doesn't summon, in laying plans, though it appears slack. The net of heaven is cast wide, though the mesh is not fine, yet nothing slips through. The way of heaven is without limit, and as it is without limit, it must be without name. Therefore, neither can anything be said truly to be Tao, or truly not to be Tao. One may ask, but is this not contradictory? If the Tao is nameless, and if it is indescribable, how is it named Tao, and how have you been describing it? This is an important question and one that at least some of the authors may have been aware of, as the label of Tao is spoken about in chapter 25. I know not its name, so I style it the way. I give it the makeshift name of the great. The authors, taking on the role of Lao Tzu, establish that even the Tao Te Ching doesn't know the Tao's true name, but compelled to speak of it, because of its importance and despite its ineffability, the text gives it the Zi of Tao, Zi and name are not identical, as Brian Van Norden describes the former as a formal nickname used to respectfully address those with whom one is not intimately familiar. Dao is then only a nickname, given because no name could be more intimate. So Dao is not its name in the sense that it distinguishes the Dao from all else. Dao is only its name for lack of any name or word being able to capture what it truly is. To become attached to the name of Tao would be misguided, stuck to the limited, missing the moon for the finger. An alternative translation of the first line suggests this too. In Chinese, the Wangbi version begins chapter 1 as Dao He Dao Fei Chang Dao, with help from the non-distinction between most verbs and nouns in classical Chinese, it may be translated more literally as the Daos that can be Daoed are not the constant Dao. The second Dao, taken as a verb, shifts the meaning from the rejection of any doctrinal or linguistic Tao to any Tao whatsoever. 
This would include even the Tao of the Tao Te Ching, when taken too literally. Therefore, even the Tao of the Tao Te Ching is an artificial title that fails to grasp what it points towards. Yet, the Tao and its implications do not simply end here, with the acknowledgement of a way beyond the grasp of words. In the total 81 chapters of the text, there are plenty of references to the Tao, its virtue, or its exemplar, the sage. And to do so, the Tao and its strategy is explored through the Tao Te Ching by the use of apophysis. But I'll leave the exploration of this to Will. A common tool used to explain or hint at information in the Tao Te Ching is apophysis. This rhetorical method of presenting an idea or preconception only to deny or refute it in the next line is found even in the opening passage. The Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. As used in theological contexts, apophysis is closely tied to negative theology, which is, for example, a description of God, Tao, through negative statements about qualities and characteristics that Tao does not possess, such as, Tao is not confined by time or space. Apophysis in the Tao Te Ching utilizes this method of invoking negative statements to add the important element of ambivalence and shrouding the concept of Tao in mystery. Apophysis can also be used to refute preconceptions. Something important to keep in mind, as Ian mentioned, is that Confucians also had a conception of Tao, and some argue the authors of the Tao Te Ching were responding to the Confucian misconception of Tao. Finally, apophysis in the Tao Te Ching serves the function of aiding in describing the characteristics a thing does not have as a means of guiding the reader to a better understanding. Chapter 14 repeats this pattern of denying categorization and imposition of human and societal categories on Tao. Look, it cannot be seen, it is beyond form. Listen, it cannot be heard, it is beyond sound. Grasp, it cannot be held, it is intangible. These three are indefinable. Knowing the ancient beginning is the essence of Tao. This ancient beginning is the origin of things from emptiness. In an essay about apophysis and Taoism, William Frank argues non-action, Wu Wei, is the apophatic path that they indicate as an ethical application of this natural apprehension of and response to the universe. The action of non-action aims to enable us to move freely in alignment with the ebb and flow of nature. This doing-non-doing, aligning with the processes of nature, aids the non-doer in coming closer to the Tao. It also hints at how important apophysis is in Taoism. Furthermore, in that same essay, Frank argues Tao's transcendent and imminent character is better articulated as being apophatic. He goes on to state, in Chinese and in Western apophatic wisdom alike, the purpose of representation is not to lay down the definitive truth, but rather to point as an index to the way or truth that lies beyond saying. Worthy of mention is that apophysis is not found exclusively in the Tao Te Ching, but is also a common theme in the Zhuangzi as well. This is seen in large part through the use of musical metaphor, and in particular, within the story of the Yellow Emperor song to Cheng of North Gate, as found in chapter 14. This leads to strengthen the claim that apophysis holds significance in Taoist thought. We can see apophysis in Taoism as a method of explaining, which also keeps in line with the prolific usage of negative statements found in the Tao Te Ching. Apophysis as negative theology in Taoism is a topic still being explored by those within and just outside the field of philosophy. Frank concludes his essay writing, I present nature in the Chinese conception not so much as a fundamental alternative to theistic conceptions of divinity, but rather as a different and more consistently apophatic way of approaching an abyssal mystery or enigma at the source and foundation of all reality and I, for one, am inclined to agree. The Tao, being simultaneously beyond the grasp of names, and yet of supreme importance, makes the philosophy of the Tao Te Ching a mysticism. 
not only in a vague sense of the Tao Te Ching reaching for something beyond, but in the concrete sense of mysticism as defined as the belief in a certain kind of knowledge that cannot be adequately expressed in words, but is important to human life in general. The Tao of the Tao Te Ching checks all of these boxes, rendering the philosophy a mysticism. While not conventional, in tuneness with the Tao may be said to be a knowledge of sorts. As with the quote, those who speak do not know, those who know do not speak. There is a clear knowledge here, but this knowledge, as we have said prior, cannot be put into words, because the Tao that can be told is not the constant Tao. It can't be boxed within the limits of language. Yet the Tao is crucial to human life if one is to live well. As it is said in chapter 60, approach the universe with Tao and evil is not powerful, but its power will not be used to harm others. Not only will it do no harm to others, but the sage himself will also be protected. And this mysticism has implications beyond the Tao itself. Initially, mysticism surrounding the ineffability of the Tao carries over into skepticism about language in general. If language serves to divide and cannot grasp the Tao, that which is of real importance, just how helpful is language? For those seeking the Tao, language is often an obstruction. Chapter 32 exhibits this through the use of another motif, pu, or the block of unworked wood, a symbol of simplicity and genuineness. Only when it, the uncarved block, is cut are their names. As soon as there are names, one ought to know that it is time to stop. Knowing when to stop can be free from danger. Through distinguishing, names carve up the unworked block. Names separate this from that, interrupting the natural genuineness of all this. In doing so, people are put into danger because names and their meanings spark argumentation and conflict. They create the desirable, wealth, fame, and power, and the undesirable, poverty, loneliness, and weakness. People seek one and despise the other, only to fight for the former. This, coupled with the Tao Te Ching's use of paradoxical language, serves to shave off the limitations of linguistic representation and penetrate further into true knowledge, which isn't within the bounds of language. Thus, the discourse of the Tao Te Ching is set to propel its readers into the non-discursive, into action, because ultimately, true knowledge isn't to be found in names, but through the emulation of the Tao in one's practice. Wu Wei, or non-action, is one means of doing so. It involves forfeiting one's personal desires and contrivances to act naturally and without interference. With ethical ideas like Wu Wei, Van Norden concludes that Taoism is a mysticism not through vision, but through action, not of transcendence, but of imminence. And by forgetting names and acting naturally, one can be modeled on that which has been nicknamed the Tao. This video has only focused on the namelessness of Tao. Thus, it has been a complete account of neither the Tao in the Tao Te Ching, nor the philosophy of the Tao Te Ching, but hopefully it helped explain a bit of the unexplainable. And that's all we've got to talk about today. I'd like to give a shout out to Will for helping me make this video. And if you enjoyed it, feel free to leave a like and subscribe. Please let me know your thoughts about the topic, anything you disagreed with, or thought I got wrong down below. And until next time.